So a great way to reduce stress for your dog during this time is to give them that gift of predictability. This means having a schedule that they can rely on, which includes their bathroom breaks, their meals, playtime, walks, and downtime. Welcome to episode 12 of the Podoption Guide podcast. I'm your host, Bethany Muir, as always, and this is your one-stop shop for the knowledge and advice you need to adopt and integrate the rescue dog of your dreams. I'm not going to lie, I was pretty excited to actually uh, come talk to you guys today because I have been working so hard on building this membership, getting ready to launch it, and I've been working away at that, but you know, I've never been about writing. (laughs) And so it is a bit dull uh, writing so much, even though I love the content, I just don't like writing. So this is more my speed. I'd much rather uh, have a QA and a video call with you guys than have to write something else out. But um, I'm really excited for that part of the membership. And I'm really stoked to get to like have that interaction. But uh, for now, this podcast will do. So today I wanted to talk a bit about integration. By definition, that word means, you know, to unify with something or to incorporate it into a larger unit. And when we're discussing rescue dogs, integrating kind of means incorporating your rescue dog into your home, your family, your lifestyle. And it's that introduction, the the exposure and socialization uh, of your rescue dog to those aspects of your life. So uh, that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. And I absolutely love helping others with this part of the adoption process because I have experienced just how overwhelming it can be and uh, just how much time you can spend searching for different approaches and methods to use when different behaviors come up, Uh, specifically when I adopted uh, my project Rory. (laughs) She's the Dalmatian. She was eight months old at the time, and I knew it. I went head over heels into this adoption process knowing she was um, a piece of work. You know, she was not good with strangers, barked constantly at us when we met her. Um, But I knew she had a lot of potential and I was excited to challenge myself in my training skills and see uh, how how much I could improve her life and uh, if that would be, you know, really rewarding for me as well. So uh, it has been and uh, she's made me learn so much and I wouldn't be here today uh, talking to you without having had the experience of adopting her because uh, she, she really couldn't have been more challenging. So I also know how difficult it can be to ask the rescue or shelter for any help during this time because of how the process is these days, there is a bit of a fear that they'll think uh, if you're having any troubles that you're going to want to return the dog. And of course, that's not necessarily what you're thinking. But, you know, just the little minute problems end up turning into big problems down the road if we don't deal with them. So if that's a hindrance at all, that you don't want to reach out to the rescue because you're a little worried they're going to think you want to return the dog when you don't, uh, that, you know, that, that definitely inhibits you from, from moving forward. So, uh, I want to be helpful to you and, and provide you with some suggestions for that time in your dog adoption journey. And, uh, the truth is it's, it's natural that your rescue dog will have to decompress and adjust to a new environment. So when you bring your dog home, this integration aspect of the adoption process, uh, you want it to be a smooth transition, but no matter what dog you get, there will be things that come up and you're going to have to deal with them. Okay. So, uh, 
really even more so if your dog comes from a shelter or a kennel environment, they have um, often just had a lot more um, triggers to deal with. So strange people coming in to see them at the shelter, uh, maybe having to look at people through glass or uh, cage doors, uh, having to look at other dogs, that can be really overwhelming. So, uh, you know, Take a minute with me here and just let's get into a dog's head for when you first bring them home. So you, a stranger, go pick them up and uh, you're probably really excited and they're probably like, who is this person? And then you put a leash on them and you're also taking them away from the people they know. And then you put them into your car, which is probably a completely foreign environment for them. It's not the same car they were last in. And uh, maybe they're in a kennel. Maybe they're not in a kennel this time. And then you're taking them to a new environment. And there's all these different smells and sounds and sights. Then you get them home and you take them out. And again, you're on a different street, a different house. There's more new strange people coming and excited to meet the dog and, uh, you know, those sights, sounds, scents, and then often new rules. So many of these new things can really be overwhelming for anyone. So you can imagine how it is for a dog that can't communicate the same way what they're taking in and uh, what they're feeling, right? Um, and they've also had more adjustment than just that moment. They've they've probably just went from one environment to another to another, right? Uh, sometimes they end they go in a shelter very briefly and then they end up in a foster home, or they've been on a plane ride and then they were in a foster home. Like all those things kind of build up to create a lot of overwhelm for these dogs. So when you get them home, there is some decompression that needs to happen. So they have to basically just come down from all that excitement and that change and just start to take in everything that's new. And uh, hopefully it's not too overwhelming and they can take it in slowly and start to adjust. So in order to allow them to really decompress and to relax and to feel comfortable, uh, there are some integration staples that you can employ to really encourage a smooth transition. So those are the things I want to share with you today so that you have a good start and you're, you're giving the dog the space they need to come out of their shell in their own time because those first three days, three weeks, three months are crucial crucial. And, you know, it can take up to six months, nine months for your dog to really settle in and start to show them true selves. Uh, Usually with the average dog we're seeing at more like three months. Number one, the first training staple that you should employ when you bring your rescue dog home is setting up a routine for them. So a great way to reduce stress for your dog during this time is to give them that gift of predictability. This means having a schedule that they can rely on, which includes their bathroom breaks, their meals, playtime, walks, and downtime. Um, a lot of people forget that, that even having them know when, when they're going to be allowed to rest and just go to their safe space that's crucial in their routine as well. So a a good routine gives your dog a sense of security, which also encourages them to trust you because they go, oh yeah, this is what we did yesterday. Oh, oh right. This is just what we did the day before. Oh, this is okay. I'm, I'm good with this. So you'll find out if there's certain things that don't quite suit your dog as you expect. So if um, maybe your walk isn't quite long enough for them and uh, they don't seem quite ready for rest, then you'll have to go, okay, so it's walk and then it's a little playtime or it's playtime and then a, a walk and then we rest so that you're making sure they're more satisfied um, throughout their routine. But 
you know, it seems like a simple thing and you're just going to go about your routine naturally with the dog added, but you have to think about uh, their specific needs and how you're fitting them in. And so that it's not, uh, oh, I guess we'll just do their supper now because we got to run for a hockey practice. Well, that's, that doesn't really work that way. When you get a dog home, they do need to come first and you need to make sure that it's regimented because if they can trust and understand what's to come next, as dogs do, if you've ever owned a dog, you know that they uh, will learn what time dinner usually comes at. They'll learn what time they should usually get up in the morning. So that is important and they come to expect things. So don't mess with their trust or comfortability by being too flexible or fluid uh, during those first uh, few weeks when they come home. Okay, so important to provide that structure for them because they will feel so much more comfortable. So no matter what, you make sure it happens at a certain time, even if that means, okay, I usually feed the dog, but now Sarah's going to feed the dog. The second training staple is leadership. So it is tempting when you get your dog home to cuddle them to no end. Uh, In your mind, you know, you brought them out of this dark existence into a world of joy and leisure and and all you want to do is spoil them. However, uh, dogs crave leadership intrinsically like they need it and want it and uh, you might not think that because some dogs just rule the roost so easily but that's really only because they see a void and they fill it so if you don't provide that direction or that structure they'll quickly seek to fill that role and that often manifests itself in nuisance behaviors like barking and pulling on leash and guarding and destructive chewing. All those things can be a result of just not having a strong leader, not having someone telling them what they need to be doing on a regular basis and setting expectations of them. So we found this with my dog Rory uh, pretty quickly that she was uh, ready to take the reins <laughs> and would easily do so and was yet yeah, barking because she uh, felt like she owned the house, uh, pulling on lead outside and not giving us any eye contact or any attention during walks. She would um, do some destructive chewing when we left the house because, again, she she felt like she owned the place. Um, And she was in her crate right away when we got her home. So the destructive chewing was uh, after we had let her out of her crate after some time. But uh, nonetheless, any time during the first few years when we had Rory and we were kind of working on our training with her, uh, if our leadership faltered at all, like we were just not both on it all the time and we're slipping a bit, we would see those things come out in Rory. We would see her uh, default to some of these uh, nuisance behaviors and that's never nice. So um, you can really demonstrate leadership by just doing some basic obedience training, sit, stay down, um, by setting some boundaries like where your dog can follow you around the house and and where they should be during meal times. You know, uh, do you want them to sit at the door and wait before they go out in the backyard before you release them? Uh, making sure that they have a word for release so that they don't just kind of get up off their bed whenever they want. You say, okay, now you can go or okay, now you can eat your dinner. Uh, just those simple tools or tactics that you employ during uh, your day-to-day can really help them understand like, oh yeah, she's going to tell me what to do. I don't need to worry about what I'm doing right now because I can just look to them for guidance. And um, really, you're just setting those expectations, you know. We expect you to not be begging at the table. We expect you to not be sitting here with your head on my lap, um, hoping to jump up on the couch. You know, you're going to tell me to go to bed and then invite me over when you want to give me some attention. 
all those little things just show that you're the leader and uh, they can relax because they don't have to be. Number three is consistency. So another way to make sure that your dog has a smooth transition when you bring them home from the rescue is that you just follow through. Uh, Follow through is just as important as proving yourself as a leader. So if you're going to uh, be asking your dog certain obedience basics, well, if you don't follow through with those things on a regular basis, what good does that do? So don't risk confusing your dog by enforcing rules here or there. You either do requires things or you don't require certain behavior and it's best to get everyone in the household on board as well so that everyone knows what the rules are they should be clear and what your expectations are for your new family member so you can even write a list put it on the wall put it on your fridge so that everyone knows okay we expect our dog to sit and stay before it gets to go have its meal we expect the dog to sit and stay before it goes outside we expect the dog to be in bed during meal times we uh, will initiate play with the dog but not let the dog bring toys to us and ask us to play you know Whatever you choose, even if it's little things like where the dog will sleep, where the dog's allowed to sleep, is it allowed to be on the bed, is it allowed to be on the couch, Uh, maybe it's only allowed to be on the couch if you invite it up, all those things are important. And I know some rules will, will get softer as time goes on, and that happens in all households, but it's really good to start with a lot of structure, and then you can dial it back a little bit. So, uh... Make sure everyone's on board with the new behaviors and even if they all just know them, you know, certainly if you have some younger kids, they might not be able to enforce certain requirements or certain rules that you might have for your dog. But obviously, if they're not old enough, then you should you or your uh, another person who's old enough should be around to enforce those things. Okay, or you know, the dog's in a crate so that they don't have to be worrying about those things when you aren't around. Number four, another training staple for when you bring your dog home is to have a safe space. This could be one of the most important ones, really. Um, Immediately make a safe place for your new dog to go to. So this could either be a bed, a crate, or a small room. And uh, hopefully you'll have some idea as to what your dog is going to prefer based on a talk with the foster parent prior to bringing them home or based on what their their profile had said, their adoption profile, because... um, Most dogs will either like prefer a crate or not, and uh, some just might need a bed, and that's okay. But you just need to make sure that the safe space is in a nice quiet spot and has a nice bed in it. And then you start training them to go to their safe space with a place command. So uh, you first start by luring them with a treat to the spot and reward them with that treat once they're on it and eventually you kind of wait to reward them with the treat till they have laid down on it so you can kind of encourage them to go down on the bed um, or in the crate and then give them the treat and then you encourage them not only go to their place but then also start staying with short periods um, and working your way up to longer durations so Rory again she's really good at going to bed not so good at staying in bed and I realized well yeah we never really worked that much on uh, giving her a release signal so we just had her go to bed and then we were kind of directly there so she would stay until we um, kind of stopped paying attention and then she would move. So she still chose to get to leave bed and so to this day we were finding that when we were working at the door you know she would go to bed but she wouldn't stay in bed long enough. So we've been working on the release and saying okay and letting her go. So first you lure them to the bed. You give them that treat once they're doing whatever you want them to do, whether that's all four paws on the bed or laying down on the bed or sitting on the bed, that's really up to you. I would often say laying down so that they're comfortable and then give them the treat 
And then almost immediately you say, okay, and you can walk away and then they often follow. And then you kind of increase the period of time, which can be really minimal (laughs) at the start, uh, to when you say, okay, and they start to understand that that okay is allowing them off the bed. That's the release. And you can use it in other ways, right? When you're releasing them from sitting on the mat right near the door to go outside or releasing them uh, from the mat to go to bed or releasing them for their dinner. So uh, that's the release that's as key as telling them when to go to bed is also to tell them that they can get out of bed. Now, one of the things that people often completely forget about a safe space, which is their bed or their crate or their little room, is that the only way that they can truly feel safe in this space, especially if they're this new dog, they don't know this environment well, they're like new stuff's happening around them all the time, right? Like they're just taking it all in. Well, the only way they're going to trust that this is a good place to go to and that they're going to want to go to this place is if no one, and I mean no one, bothers them while they're there. So it should really be only positive or good things coming while they're there. So if they're in a crate, you know, they get their their chew toy there or they get their Kong or whatever. But otherwise, people shouldn't be trying to pet them while they're resting. People shouldn't be trying to pet them in their bed. No kids, no pets should be bothering them there. If you have multiple pets, don't just cram them all together in one place for their beds because they're going to be so overwhelmed they need to be able to rest. And uh, there are lots of dogs that will sleep with one eye open if they really don't feel comfortable. So watch for that. You know, you can always move the space if you realize that it's not conducive to rest for them. And sometimes people find that putting a towel or a blanket over the crate helps the dog just zone out and that helps them better rest. But You'll have to see what your dog's preference is, but just know that it shouldn't be in the middle of uh, commotion. I certainly like my kids to know that they should never touch the dogs in their bed. It's okay for them to go over and wave and say hi, but then walk away. You know, they, they can wave from a distance. They don't need to go approach the dog in their bed. Because this is a good tip for any child to know, uh, never to touch a dog in their bed. They should be able to rest and not be scared that they're going to randomly be uh, walked on by someone or have someone touching them when they're in the middle of sleep. And another way to really offer that security when you first bring your rescue dog home is to just leave a leash trailing on them so that you can ensure that you can intervene safely and guide your dog where you want them to go uh, whenever you need to. And and this just really helps when you're establishing communication with your new dog because they might not have that good recall yet and they might just be scared or not understanding where you're, what you're expecting of them. So if you have a leash on them, then you can always just kind of guide them to where they need to be and And again, if you have kids, they need to know that that leash is not to be touched by anyone other than the adults because uh, that could be a a breach of trust for the dog and uh, can be a bit a bit nerve-wracking and could be dangerous for the kids too if that spooks the dog. So um, make sure that you you have that lead on them to help assist them in the first little bit and uh, that'll just make everything go a little bit more smoothly. And the fifth training staple to help make for a smooth transition when you bring your rescue dog home is that you need to reduce triggers. So it's not uncommon for new dog owners to want to flaunt their new dog. (laughs) And sometimes that means that there's this onslaught of visitors or uh, trips to lots of different locations. And... uh, It's great that you're excited, but it is important to take your dog's mental state into account. So even if they seem like they're they're doing so great and they seem so calm and laid back, uh, there's a lot going on underneath the surface, okay? 
and you you don't really know this dog fully yet. So you want to take things slowly with them so that um, as things come up, you can manage them. So this means that you don't really want to overwhelm them with too many experiences or people. You've got to take it slow, let their response dictate the pace. So make sure that you're paying attention to their body language and not just, oh, you know, they seem fine. They're not scared. Like they're not outwardly, you know, running away. Well, that's one thing. But another thing is, you know, is their tail tucked beneath their legs? Um, Is there tension in their whole body? Uh, Are they, is their mouth parted and open, okay, that means maybe a little bit more relaxed. So that's a good thing. Um, Or are they shying away? Are they um, immediately rolling over and exposing their belly? Like that's a submissive stance and doesn't necessarily mean they're comfortable. So those are things to take into account when you're thinking about, you know, trying something new with your dog. And you'll really be learning about what upsets your dog during this time, what stresses them out, what excites them. And that could be a few things or it could be a lot of things. So try to make it a rule in the first few weeks that you really only expose them to one new person, place, or thing at a time. One, not three of those things, you know, not in one new person and a new place and a thing. Just one new thing one new person, or one new place. Uh, So that if you're going to find a trigger, something that triggers your dog, that uh, whether it excites them, it upsets them, it stresses that, you can control that because you have more of a controlled environment because there's only one new factor, okay? This will really allow you to best support your dog as they experience those things with you for the first time. And it can avoid trigger stacking, which... Uh, is basically having to experience multiple triggers at once or in progression, so uh, in in a similar time. And that can be overwhelming and, and seemingly unbearable for your dog. And so that's when you you really start to see your dog's worst behavior is if trigger stacking happens. So we want to avoid that at all costs and not put too much on their plate. And so even something as simple as, uh, let's give the dog a bath. Let's trim their nails. That might be seem like something nice to do because you don't want them to be fresh and clean and uh, it's a new start, but you want to avoid giving them a bath in those first few weeks if possible, right? It should only be if you absolutely need to, to allow them to decompress and to not have uh, a stressful scenario, okay? I Again, I know that you might do one new thing, but you also want to reduce how many new things as well. That still adds to trigger stacking. So if it's one new thing multiple times a day, that's still a lot for your dog. So we're trying to keep it um, low key and as stress-free as possible so that they just get the lay of the land. That's all they need to do for the first few weeks. And then you can start adding things in and start experimenting a little once you start to know your dog more and they have more trust in you. Um, and that really gives you a better bond with your dog before you have to deal with these challenges. For more integration guidance with your rescue dog, you can find my free dog walking mini course at www.podoptionguide.com forward slash walk your dog with confidence mini course. Or you can join my membership waitlist to get the most up to date information on when the Podoption Guide membership experience is set to launch which is very soon. Uh, The membership offers regular Q&A calls with myself, um, a private community, as well as training resources uh, and a step-by-step guide on how to go through the adoption process to to really get you off on the right foot. And uh, a huge part of this membership is helping you in the integration process. So even if you don't need the help with the adoption part and you've just got your dog and now you're like, man, there's a lot of challenges we're dealing with. I'm here for you. Uh, I know what it's like to deal with a challenging dog. And I know what it's like to be like, nope, I'm sticking it out. We're, we're good together, but we have, we have some work to do. And, uh, I know how to, to help you navigate that. So join that membership waitlist, which is www.podoptionguide.com forward slash membership waitlist. 
today's episode takeaways are that you should really expect that when you bring that rescue dog home, that there will be adjustment. It's an adjustment period, it's a decompression period, and it's a bonding experience. So uh, you really are starting out from square one, building a bond with this dog. And the more uh, structure, routine, leadership, consistency, uh, safe comfortable existence as well as uh, reduced stress that you provide, the better. If this episode gave you some really useful tips for bringing your rescue dog home, then make sure to share this episode link with a friend or post a screenshot to your Instagram or Facebook story. I absolutely love hearing your feedback on this podcast. New episodes are uploaded on Thursdays, and uh, don't forget to get in touch with me on social at Pod Option Guide via Instagram or my Facebook page. And thanks again for listening.